Greetings from Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Scott Gardner, and I'm here today with Rita McGrath for today's webinar, Seeing Around Corners, Five Tips to Navigate Inflection Points and Build Resilience. Before I introduce Rita, I'd like to just go over a few quick logistics. As you'll see on the next screen, a recording of this webinar will be sent to you. If you'd like to tweet about this webinar, please do so at hashtag CBS Exec Ed. And finally, most importantly, please submit those questions to the Q&A box. Rita and I will get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes. It's my pleasure to introduce Rita Gunther McGrath. She is the best-selling author, sought after speaker, and a longtime faculty member of Columbia Business School Executive Education. She's widely recognized as a premier expert on leading innovation and growth during times of uncertainty. She has received the number one achievement award for strategy from the prestigious Thinkers 50 and has been consistently named one of the world's top 10 management thinkers in its biannual ranking. As a consultant to CEOs, her work has had a lasting impact on the strategy and growth programs of Fortune 500 companies worldwide. She is the author of The End of Competitive Advantage and Seeing Around Corners, how to spot inflection points in business before they happen, which is coming out in paperback this week. She is also the faculty director of our upcoming executive education program, Leading Strategic Growth and Change, taking place this October 18th through the 22nd. Rita, it's always great to be with you. I'm gonna leave the stage and I'll rejoin you in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> That's great, Scott. Thanks so much. And uh, thank you all for joining in this webinar. It's a real pleasure to have a chance to share some ideas. As Scott mentioned, I will be talking about topics similar to this during a full week long, pretty intensive program that we run, which does begin the week of October 18th. And I'll be there the whole time. So if this sort of thing appeals to you, that might be an option worth um, exploring. But what we're going to talk about today is the nature of strategic inflection points and specifically, how do we motivate people to take action after they've seen a strategic inflection point uh, to create resilience in the organization? So it's a little bit of a different topic than I've explored on previous occasions. Um, so let's start off with a strategic context. And as Scott's mentioned, I've written a lot about the fact that competitive advantages, which once were believed to extend for long periods of time, are actually becoming compressed. And this is an example of that phenomenon from the gaming business. This is kind of a historical snapshot when in the beginning, you know, we had arcade games. That's all there was. You, know, you had to go to a physical place during opening hours and throw money at this refrigerator sized machine. The game itself was analog. So it was made of mechanical pulleys and things. Um, and so the next big wave of change took place when we started to see the beginning of software in the gaming world. And of course, we saw different form factors come in, these portable games, games you could play at home, games you could play on multiple purpose devices, all that was great. And what I want to draw your attention to with this slide is the pattern which you see, which is the pattern of competitive advantage and how it changes, beginning with the innovation and growth process, the sort of stuff my course is about, uh, how do you create new advantages? Then indeed, the period of time when you get to exploit your existing advantages. And then once a particular advantage has run its course, how do you transform your organization? And so let's bring this up to date with the state of gaming today. And what we see is those organizations that have been able to capitalize on the next generation of growth uh, have been able to actually lift up their prospects uh, to the point where, uh, you know, arcade games are still with us, <laughs> but as a proportion of the total mix of the sector, they're much, much smaller than they were. Console games still relevant, but as we see in this slide, the rise of mobile has been pretty substantial. And so we have games now that are played in all kinds of different form factors. And I imagine if I were talking about this a couple of years from now, we have games played on headsets, games played on Microsoft HoloLens, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and as I said, what matters is not the particular piece of technology that we're looking at. What matters is this pattern. If you want to be able to take advantage of growth, you need to be able to transform. That's that third process. Um, which brings us to the interesting question of strategic inflection points. And I define the strategic inflection point as some shift 
It could be outside your organization, it could be inside your organization, it could be something you do, but it changes the nature of what was true by an order of 10x, so 10x cheaper, 10x faster, 10x more convenient, uh, 10x more reliable. It shifts something fundamental about the constraints that used to be true in your uh, environment. So let's take a simple example. Uh, I'll use the case of men's shaving. <laughs> and the dominant player in men's shaving for many years was the Gillette company, right? Still are the dominant player in men's shaving. And their business model was based on a set of constraints that had to do with the linkage between these big consumer products companies. Um, Gillette was bought by Procter & Gamble in 2005 for $57 billion. So big consumer products companies, retail outlets like Walgreens and Costco and Walmart. Um, and that set of distribution mechanisms was in place because there really weren't great alternatives. So here's the sort of overall business model for men's shaving. We invest in R&D that allows us to create great new products for which we can charge a price premium. We use our armies of employees to get these things into those retail outlets. And the whole thing is undergirded with millions of dollars of mass market advertising. Um, and this worked great. And so I'll start our story uh, with a case that I actually taught at Columbia Business School when I first joined, uh, the case of the launch of the sensor razor. And this was a brilliant innovation that came out of their R&D. So they figured out that by shrinking these springs to like micro levels, they could actually put two blades on a stem. And they called this the sensor. It, its benefit was it's supposed to produce the super, super, you know, smooth shave really close shade, the best a man can get, right? So they launched this thing uh, at the Super Bowl in 1990, very aggressive, very expensive launch, huge success. They had this cartoon that they used to, to, to promote the new product, which was uh, one, the first blade kind of came along and lifted the hair off your face and the second blade came and zapped it. And this was so successful. It, it was so successful, it became a, a business school case. It was called the case of the sensor, the launch of the sensor. Um, and it was held up as an example of strategic strategic boldness. And this got them through most of the 90s, and that was awesome. But then, you know, kind of came time for the next innovation. So what are we going to do? I've got it. I've got it. Three. We'll put three blades on a stem. This is going to be amazing, right? And to launch this thing, they had this fighter jet, right? So if you were cool enough to own what they called the Mach 3, you were cool enough to sit in the cockpit of a fighter jet. This was amazing. Um, and this was great. And they settled back and they thought they were in for another decade of, you know, steady as she goes uh, performance when strategy disaster strikes. Schick comes to market with the world's first four bladed razor. You're Gillette, what, what do you do? You have now literally spent hundreds of millions of dollars teaching consumers, you know, three blades are better than two, you should pay more. Two blades are better than one, you should pay more. And now a competitor has come to market with the world's first four bladed razor. Oh my God, what do you do? Well, you know what they did? <laughs> they unleashed all the lawyers. They tied everybody up in patent court for you know months on end. And then they rushed to market with the next innovation, which was, wait for it, five. Yes, five blades. Um, okay, so my point here is not to make fun of Gillette. They're very capable, very smart people who really know their business, but their way of thinking about their business is fundamentally framed by that historical model of distribution through conventional retail. Meanwhile, meanwhile, um, <laughs> sort of in a California garage somewhere, is a guy named Mike Dubin. Um, he's a failed entrepreneur. He actually applied to Columbia Business School. We turned him down. He's sort of at a loss. And uh, he has this business partner, uh, a guy named Mark, somebody other, who um, has this interesting job where he buys stuff from one part of the world and sells it for a profit in another. And the two of them get to talking at a dinner party. And Mark is sort of saying, yeah, I wonder how I can unload these razors. Who would buy razors? And the evening wears on and the two of them get to talking about all the negatives in the Gillette model. You think about it, there's a lot of negatives. The blades are expensive. That's by design, they're supposed to be expensive. Uh, you, you have to go to a retail store to get them. And because they're expensive and they're small, they're often locked up behind this sort of razor fortress, which is a nightmare to get into. You have to find like the only employee in the store with the keys to the thing. 
and, 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 and. And Dubin has an epiphany. He says, why do we do it this way? This is insane. Why don't we just send you high quality but reasonably priced razors right to your door? And this was the beginning of what came to be the Dollar Shave Club. Um, and what made that possible? Well, what I would argue is it's a whole series of inflection points around the digital revolution that allowed them to set that company up with remarkable economies. So they built their tech stack on Amazon Web Services. They got the word out with this absolutely hilarious video that Dubin created. If you haven't seen it, you really owe it to yourself to have a look at it. It's really funny. And it was circulated like wildfire uh, on all the social media platforms. They recruited brand ambassadors via Facebook. In other words, things that used to be really big barriers to entry for a company like Gillette had now gone away. And it made it possible for a tiny little upstart within a matter of a couple of years to actually challenge Gillette's dominance in shaving. And so what we saw was a pretty catastrophic decline in their market share, not because the people at Gillette were stupid. And I really want to emphasize that the nature of inflection points is such that the thing you've been paying attention to all these years is not necessarily what is going to be driving your performance uh, going forward. And, and it's just a, you know, kind of to set the context for this notion of what do we do about strategic inflection points. So my book really has three uh, phases. The first phase is how do you see them coming? And um, what I find there is the, the, the problem that people at Gillette had, which is this you know, maniacal focus on today's recipe for success can be a blinder. So the first part of the book is really about how do you see them? The middle part of the book is how do you decide what to do about them? Uh, and that's really the focus of what I'm going to be focusing on here, which is how do you mobilize the organization to take action once you've seen an inflection point coming? And then the last part of the book is about how do you bring the rest of the organization with you? So we'll deal with that in another time. So really what we're going to focus on right now is how do you mobilize the organization when you've seen something coming that you think really deserves attention? Now, here's the problem. Um, Human beings, <laughs> when faced with sort of an ambiguous future that may or may not happen, don't necessarily behave in the most uh, productive manner. Um, and I think the past experience of the crisis has been really, really interesting because if you think about it, if you go back to sort of March, April of 2020, companies responded astonishingly well. You know, they mobilized resources, they enabled work from home. I've heard it from dozens of companies, you know, digital programs that had been on the books for years were suddenly put into force. They were executed against well. As people said to me at the time, they said, you know, we were at our absolute best. We pulled together, we did what we needed to do. We, we faced down this crisis. And, and I think that's very interesting because eventually the crisis it, not that it's left us, but it's now become much more kind of part of our day to day, right? Um, and I, you know, if you go back to those times back in the, the sort of spring of 2020, we were hearing, oh, this is all going to be over by Easter. I don't know, by Fourth of July, things are going to be fine. Then it was, oh, definitely by by Thanksgiving. Then by Christmas, and 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 then we got the vaccine, and it was like, wow, okay, this is finally now going to come to an end. To the point where we got to that same kind of. May, June period of 2021. And an awful lot of us were saying, this is great. We're ready to move on. And then entered the problem that a lot of people aren't, aren't availing themselves of this uh, vaccine, which is kind of slowed everything down again. So um, how do we now get ourselves ready for whatever comes next? Once the immediate crisis is passed, and we're now in this kind of ongoing, you know, situation that doesn't really have an end date, right? There's no, there, I can't look at you and say, oh, you know, by, by Christmas, this is all gonna be over because we've heard this before, right? So how do we um, invest for a future where we don't really know when, and we don't really know if, and we don't really know what the impacts are going to be. And so what I'd like to introduce is a concept which was uh, introduced to me uh, by, by an HR lead, uh, leader who said, you know, what she really admires is leaders who have what she calls a cathedral mindset. And the reference is to people that worked on cathedrals back in the Middle Ages, you know, builders and carpenters and artisans working on that, knowing they would never see it completed, but being willing to do their part for this glorious thing that was going to be 
uh, put together in the future. And I think it's an interesting metaphor for how we need want to think about organizations. And we've all heard lots of wailing about economic short-termism and why these things are hard to do. Uh, but I think if we have that mindset that says we want to be you know, putting our, our energy into something that's larger than ourselves and that has a longer time frame, I think that's very uh, valuable. And yet, you know, we know human beings find it very difficult, right? We find it, and this is a picture of Champlain Towers South, and although we don't know the details of what actually happened, there is clearly a story around deferred maintenance and the owners not being willing to make painful investments today to, de de to, de to defer a possibly disastrous situation in the future. And this is the problem, right? So, you know, imagine you own a condo in this building and some report has come by and said there's all these repairs that are needed and you're just one of many, firstly. Secondly, it's going to cost you. You know, it's going to cost you today. And this thing people are saying might happen in the future, it might happen, it might not happen. And a lot of times we can make the case to ourselves that investing in resilience, investing in prevention is something we can put off something we can put off. And I think this is the crux of the problem we have with a lot of these large scale um, inflection points we're facing. And there are certainly at least four, the environment, you know, lots of arguments about should we invest in, in uh, helping the environment become or, or return to greater health. I mean, we're seeing a lot of clear evidence that you know mother nature is not happy right now, but there's also a lot of arguments about, well, who's gonna bear the cost of this, right? Uh, certainly when it comes to equity and social justice, right? We hear, we see a lot of evidence that this is not healthy for society. And yet the question is, well, who gives up perks and privileges to create a more inclusive and equitable uh, society? Certainly economically, uh, haves and have nots. You know, many people have really suffered during this pandemic, and many others have done really, really well. So that's something that probably deserves attention. Uh, and of course, you know, the whole pandemic situation, when is that finally going to lead us to something that might uh, be fruitful or going down the road? So what I'd like to do is offer five ideas that you may find helpful in mobile. So you've seen the inflection point, you've seen something coming now, and what you wanna do is mobilize support for doing something now, because something that might happen in the future really would be either disastrous or would be great, right? We want to prepare ourselves for a post-inflection point future. So the first thing I think is really important is you need to have a story. And it has to be a compelling story and it has to motivate action. So a great historical example of this is back, you know, back, back in the 90s, um, people suddenly realized that computer systems to save on what was then expensive storage space had been built so that come the year 2000, they would all think, oh, well, it's 1900. You know, the clocks would reset because there were only two digits for the date. Now, the stories people told about that were terrifying. You know, airplanes were going to drop out of the sky and nuclear plants were going to become unstable and we should all move to Montana and stockpile wheat. I mean, really bad stories. And what happened? We took action. So the year 2000 came. What happened? Nothing happened <laughs> because we took the story seriously. So you really want to create a compelling story with absolute action implications. The next thing is you really want to amplify the voices of what Andy Grove, who wrote the original work on inflection points, called helpful Cassandras. People who see at the edges, people who may not normally be part of your strategic conversations, get them involved and hear what they have to say. Because these are often people who you know, really see the inflection point coming and can tell the story of how that is going to affect us. Third idea is you want to have multiple responses, multiple resource pools, multiple champions, because if you have just one decision making capability, your chances of missing the broad range of what's possible is much higher. And so this is featured in a great book by Safi Bakal called Loon Shots, and he suggests that this principle allows you to create greater variety in the attempts that you make to prepare for the future. Uh, you can change the incentive systems. Um, and this is one of the huge reasons that we have so much of a struggle in our financial systems, which is that, you know, there's a lot of incentives to take short term, very profitable actions, uh, which have long term devastating consequences. So, you know, things like uh, clawbacks, if, if the long term performance isn't there, things like gearing the ultimate reward over a much longer time period than perhaps an annual one or even a quarterly one. Uh, things like causing companies to enter into longer term uh, contracts. So you wanna think about the incentives because a lot of times 
what happens when you're trying to prepare for an inflection point is that the incentives just point people in the opposite direction. And the last resort, of course, is have powerful people um, manage it, you know, have a higher authority. And an interesting example of this historically was Vannevar Bush, who in the World War II and post-World War II uh, scenarios coordinated the efforts of all these disparate scientific organizations into mounting a long-term constructive um, sort of system of responses to what would eventually become the post-war economy. So those are five things that can be put into place uh, to help you mobilize the organization once you've seen an inflection point coming. Uh, let me conclude by saying today, what we're really looking at is the intersection of strategy and innovation in a way that it's never been integrated in my career anyway. And I think that's very exciting. And you can't really talk about strategy and innovation today without referencing some kind of digital uh, phenomenon. So um, the, this is me, keep in touch. I'm pretty easy to find on the Columbia Business School website. Uh, if you have questions after, after this webinar, I'd be delighted to uh, respond to them. And let me invite Scott to come back and join me and we'll have some conversation now. Thank you, Rita. A lot of good questions came in during the webinar, before the webinar. So let's get that kicked off and we'll answer as many of those as possible. I'll probably ask if, you know, if, with your permission, if we can stay on a few sure. minutes past the hour, just because I want to get to as many questions as possible. So let's kick it off with Susan. She asked a good question, I think came in from more than a few people, but how do you include the concept of seeing around corners into strategic planning? Well, any strategic plan that, that's sensible will begin with something like a situation analysis, right? Which says, where are we? And the way that I do it is I break uh, the situation analysis into five, I call them five C's. So your first C is your customers, your competition, the complementary firms that are in your ecosystem, your own company and its capabilities, and finally context. And context is where I would put this looking out into the future, looking at, you know, what are those things that could create a 10x change to which we might have to respond. And so that's where it fits. I, I usually begin a strategic planning process with that analysis. Great. I love that. That last one. I think maybe that's what people might forget. The final one, the context, you know, to add. Absolutely. I hear those other ones a lot. I have a context is good. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Maxime. Uh, said, how do you find the time to include the what if scenarios into planning process? Would you say this is done centrally or within each business unit, the what ifs? Um, well, that's going to depend on the company, obviously, and where strategic planning kind of lands, um, which will vary by firm. Uh, the way that I do it very specifically, um, and this is described in, in the book, um, is I will take two uncertainties that matter to your organization. And I will posit um, two future possible states of those two uncertainties. So one uncertainty every company is dealing with right now is, you know, what does the next year look like in terms of the pandemic? public health, global supply chains, you know, are we digging our way out of this and it's kind of rosy or are we still gonna be grappling with this a year from now? So that would be, might be one dimension. And another dimension might be specific to your uh, category. So recently I, I, did a, I did this exercise with the forest products group and uh, we were looking at lumber demand, <laughs> you know, and is lumber demand gonna be off the charts and prices are gonna be crazy or is it gonna ease off? And if you juxtapose those to each other, what you get is four possible future scenarios. And you can tell a story about that future scenario. And then what you can do is articulate what I call a time zero event, which is the moment the inflection point has arrived. So we can look at it, we can take pictures of it, we know it's happened. The trouble is you don't want to wait until it's upon you to make these strategic choices. So what I do is say, find a time zero event, then work backward and find out what would have to be true for that particular time zero to be unfolding. So in a nutshell, I would include that exercise wherever you do your strategy. I include it for myself as an individual, you know, kind of thinking about where do we want to put resources and time for the future. Um, so you can do it corporate centrally, you can do it at a business unit level. It's a useful thing to do. And it doesn't take that much time once you block out an hour or two to really think about it. I like that, that you, you, you take the inflection point, the moment, and you work backwards uh -huh. so that when it happens, you've done all the steps, you're ready. To right. Present. Yeah, I like that. All right, next up, Jay asks, and this is an interesting question. Can we get a quick example of when seeing around corners can be helpful to the disruptor agent? In other words, the one entering the market, the one lacking resources, competing against established entities, and not the disrupted like Gillette with access to lots of cash and conventional 
channels like Super Bowl ads and things like that. So how, how it helps the entrepreneurial firm? Right. So the, 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 the disruptor agent. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, a historical example a lot of people don't know is that Twitter um, actually began as a podcasting platform. Um, and back in the day, it was a it was a four pay platform that would host kind of different podcasts. And the seeing around corners moment that happened with that team was Apple <laughs> decided to launch the uh, iTunes product and included podcasts for free. So that kind of makes your um, your upstart <laughs> idea of charging people for podcasts a little less relevant. And so the company had to pivot and became what we now know of as Twitter, um, using this idea of the same similar technology, but using this idea of short messaging to communicate status was where they originally started. Um, and so the corner they sort of saw around was they said, well, the technology we were pursuing has now hit a dead end. Um, where could we meaningfully make a contribution by, by pivoting to this other kind of business model supported, of course, by advertising. Thank you. All right, next, Teresa. She asks, would you advise nonprofits in the same way using the same five factors, or are there other factors that you would recommend? Well, with nonprofits, the critical distinction should be, and, and I always take the word nonprofit because it felt, feels weird to me to describe yourself by what you're not, you know? So, I mean, I think of nonprofits. We always, well, Rita, we always, don't we always say for benefit, right? For not benefit, right? <laughs> or something like that. Or mission-driven yeah. is the one that yeah, I Yeah, mission-driven, like. exactly. And the key reason to be a mission-driven organization as opposed to a profit-driven one is that you're serving a constituency which is not otherwise well-served. And so one of the painful decisions you have to make as a not-for-profit leader is you're actually gonna put resources into places where you know you're not gonna get them back because that's part of your mission. And otherwise, why would you exist? And so that's one of the key distinctions. Um, but the same five factors in terms of getting the organization to take action absolutely apply. For nonprofits in particular, um, I have an article that's available for download um, at a website called valize, V-A-L-I-Z-E dot com. And if you do the back, back tag, uh, hashtag and click on resources, uh, there's a downloadable article really looking at strategy for not-for-profit organizations because it is different different from strategy, you know, that, that drives money. <laughs> Same five C's, just a different mindset about. Who you're serving. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, Christine asks, what regular practices have you seen senior leadership teams adopt to keep their pulse on and adopt their strategies to these changes? Mm. I think the first and most important thing is they have to create an atmosphere of psychological safety so that people feel comfortable bringing them uncomfortable news. And a lot of CEOs don't do a very good job of this. You know, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, you know, don't bring me a problem without bringing me a solution. Well, guess what? If that's your mandate, people aren't going to bring you things. And they may not know what the solution is. <laughs> you know, they may not have all the pieces to do that. So psychological safety. Second thing is you want to have routine practices for getting out to what I call the edges of the organization. And many companies have different ways of doing it. Um, uh, site visits, uh, unannounced plant tours, um, you know, taking a role on, on, you know, what's that undercover boss, right? <laughs> there are all ways that people can get out to the edges, but some mechanism that gets you into direct contact with what's going on outside your organization is critical. Well, it's interesting because now it's sort of two sides. You're saying one is the actual going out and being in the you know the experience of your company to understand it. But the other side is is not that bring me a solution, but you have to tell me what I don't know. Right? <laughs> leader, I mean, I, I mean a leader can't know everything, and a leader has to depend on that, and then be work for the solution, which is using those five, you know, the okay. suggestions you brought. So it's much more holistic that way than just. I don't want to hear it unless there's a solution to the to the problem, right? Well, and by definition, you know, a strategic inflection point changes everything. So right. what used to work doesn't work anymore, and you need a creative response in that situation. Great. Okay. Um, let's see here. Ubald asks, what is the role of scenario thinking and or option theory to help think through risks and opportunities? I love that question. Um, so if you kind of imagine two different kinds of businesses where 
you've got low uncertainty versus high uncertainty. So a low uncertainty business, I'll give you three quick examples. I run a regional theater. I know the recipe, five shows a year. I know my patrons, I serve my local community. Everything's been done the same way for the last 35 years. Second, I sell biology textbooks to undergraduates. I know exactly, you know, pretty closely what I'm gonna sell because I know how many professors are gonna require my textbook and this is how many I print. And it's a very predictable business or bring it back to us. The Columbia Business School graduating class of 2019 is going to be remarkably similar to the Columbia Business School graduating class of 2018. Um, these are three examples of cases in which the past actually is a pretty good predictor of the future. Now, enter an inflection point, and that recipe changes. The regional theater is in slow decline. Who, you know, who defines what a textbook is anymore? <laughs> well, how are we going to rethink the MBA at Columbia Business School? These are very active conversations. And what's happening is you're pushing your conversation much more toward uncertainty. And that's where you're creating the value that comes from having options. And option value is the right to make a future choice. So ideally, it's a small investment you're making today that buys you the right to do something very interesting down the road. Um, and it's real value. It's got actually higher return on investment potential than the more you know, standardized business, but it's also more uncertain. You'll probably have more failures, which is okay if they're small and cheap. Uh, you'll probably have less you know, spreadsheet ability in, ten, in terms of the number you put in may not be the number that pops out, but it is a lot more um, attractive in terms of how you could uh, take advantage of an uncertain future unfolding. And that's really where the opportunities lie. So I think options thinking is absolutely critical to navigating these highly uncertain transition points. All right, well, I wanna finish up with, I'm gonna combine a question that came in from Patricio with a question that I always ask to end. His, his question or his question is, do you have suggestions for lead indicators you should watch for? And I just like to combine it, Rita, with a question I always ask at the end of webinars, which is, let's keep this energy. I know you're all about, let's keep this energy going with this very diverse group we have out there. We're so happy all these people are with us today, but what can they do today? What's the next thing they should do today? So what are lead indicators? And what can they do today to keep this energy with you going? Great. So a leading indicator is basically information about what might happen in the future. And you, again, work backward to well, what does that imply I need to take action on today? And, you know, I'll just take climate change as an example. Part of the problem with climate change is that it feels so big and so huge and so amorphous that we personally don't know what to do. Now compare that current, current state of the art with climate change with something that happened a few years ago, which was scientists discovered a hole in the ozone layer. Remember that? And you know, this was letting all these harmful rays through and everybody was worried about, um, about getting sunburnt and people were worried about getting cancer from being outside. But here's the thing, they also discovered a villain the specific chemical that was causing this hole in the ozone layer was CFCs. And there followed a worldwide effort to eliminate CFCs and close the hole in the ozone layer. So I think part of what we're struggling for when we try to find leading indicators is the clarity of action that is required. And I, I really want to reinforce that as you're thinking about prompting others to take action on something that you see kind of clearly, you have to build in the action implication. Otherwise, people get overwhelmed. You know, they might buy into your story, but like if I don't know what to do personally about climate change, I'm going to just be frozen in the headlights. I'm not going to do anything. Right. So what can you do now today? I'd say, you know, you can change how you use an hour a week. So I don't want you to change your whole life, but imagine taking an hour a week and using it to really step back and think about what's changing both in your environmental context and in the broader context that might create one of those 10x pressures uh, on something that you're doing today. So think about reallocating that hour Ideally, do that with a couple of other folks that you either work with or collaborate with or are, are with, because we know that if you make commitments to other people, you're much more likely uh, to, to follow through. So that's a very practical thing you can start to think about. You know, if I were to stop doing something for an hour a week, you know, do you really need to doom scroll for a whole 45 minutes every morning? Maybe you can use that time more productively. So I would suggest thinking about that. Did you say doom scroll? Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, that thing you get onto and pick your social media of choice where you just, you're horrified by what you're reading, but you're, it's so addictive, you can't stop, right? So you doom scroll. Well, exactly. Well, I think, you know, the hour a day, these the, the very, you know, very specific, you know, measures that you put out here gives people in a very uncertain time focus and, a, you know, a little bit of comfort in that, that they can just sort of systematically look at this in a way that isn't, that isn't overwhelming. So thank you, Rita. 
you and I have worked together for many, many years. It's always great to be in a classroom with you. Uh, looking forward to your upcoming program, Leading Strategic Growth and Change, October 18th, kicking that off. And I hope, uh, hope that goes really well. Thank so on behalf of Columbia Business School, Executive Education, Rita McGrath, myself, thank all of you for joining us today at the very center of business. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Thank you all.